Liz Wynott is Director of HIV Health and Prevention at Tapestry. She is one of the founders of Tapestry's Holyoke Syringe Service Program and a regional leader in the use of syringe service programs to reach patients who use drugs. She's also been an early advocate for the life-saving benefits of naloxone. Liz, thank you for that. Hi everybody, my name is Liz Wynott. I'm the Director of HIV Health and Prevention at Tapestry. And I'm gonna talk about syringe service programs and their effectiveness, and I'm gonna try to focus on a local perspective. I've been with Tapestry, which is located all over Western Mass for going on 10 years now. Um, I started out as an intern 10 years ago, and I started out in Springfield. Uh, our HIV health and prevention program there, also known as LAVOS, and I also at the same time was working at the Northampton Needle Exchange. And in the past 10 years, I think the difference between Northampton and Springfield and other communities has been um, serious. It's a uh, which I'll just go into explaining. So I'm just starting off with some visuals that of our, all of our different programs. In the upper left corner is our office in Holyoke, which we opened in 2012 to uh, provide syringe access services. And the one, when Holyoke opened in 2012, that was the first needle exchange to be approved since, I believe, 1997. And that was also the second needle exchange to open that west of Cambridge and Boston except for Northampton. Thinking about where we are now and with our panel um, and what we're talking about tonight, it's pretty amazing, but it's also to me pretty disturbing that we still have to go through this political battle to fight for needle exchange and also everything else that people are talking about tonight. And I'm actually just gonna skip and I'll come back to this. Um, I just chose some well-known statements about the effectiveness of needle exchange. There's much more, many more studies, much more evidence that has been done around this. Um, my old boss and I, Tim Purrington, I remember we were presenting to a local board of health in Greenfield, and he brought a stack of all the evidence he could find that day, and he just like pointed, printed out all that paper and just brought it there just for the effect, and that wasn't even all of the research studies that have been done. And these studies that you know, needle exchange, and that—that that is the needle, that is the syringe access. It decreases HIV and hepatitis C. Um, the cost of a syringe is 19 cents versus the lifetime cost of HIV is $380,000. So if we prevent one HIV infection per year, that's actually, we're spending less on our entire program per year than one HIV infection. This evidence was heavily studied, done in the 1990s, and also heavily studied, done with, throughout the 2000s, and it's continuing to be done around both, you know, regular syringe access, and now there's mounting evidence around safer injection facilities, will be talked about, which will be talked about in a little while. So, you know, when I think about that, that's like, what year is it? That's 20 years ago. Um, However, just want to talk about the history for a minute. But first, actually, this is just, and this is actually an outdated slide, I must admit. This, is, this slide's probably 10 years old, and this is just some of the public health and policy organizations and faith-based organizations that publicly came out in support of syringe access. And I just wanted to give a brief history of local syringe service initiatives in Western Mass. So, in the mid-90s, the state approved for there to be up to 10 needle exchange pilot programs throughout the state. And that was decided because of the rising incidence of HIV and also the rising rates of overdose and hepatitis C. So at that time, the first above ground official needle exchanges were open in Boston, Cambridge. And then actually a year later, it was expanded to 10, 10 sites. And then that year, Northampton was able to open one, and Provincetown was able to open one. And those four cities were able to somehow open one by arguing with whoever within their city um, to get one passed, because up until very re recently, you had to get approval from 
what's it called, a local or public, whatever, a local official, I forget the exact what it's called now. But um, what body you had to get approval from was never defined. So, you know, within the next few years, there were multiple attempts to open up needle exchanges across the state, including two times in Springfield and also two times in Holyoke. Springfield has the third highest rate of HIV, Holyoke has the fourth. And even though that's true, Springfield does not have a needle exchange now, and Holyoke's again just opened five years ago. In 2006, a little over 10 years ago, needles became legalized. You were able to buy a syringe at a pharmacy, and I like pause on that. Before 2006, you could get arrested for having a syringe on you. So when people talk about stigma or talk about even the, you know, like seeing discarded syringes or whatever, only 10 years ago, it stopped being an arrestable offense to carry a syringe. And when a law changes, it's taken many years for officers and whoever to respect that law and not arrest drug users. And drug users today still are arrested or it's a probable cause for like further search if they are found with a syringe. Um, in 2012, the fifth needle exchange in the entire state was opened in the city of Holyoke. And the, it was because of the courage that the current mayor of Holyoke, Mayor Alex Morse, took at that time um, to really look at what, uh, well, he, he, him and his, the Board of Health at that time in Holyoke, they re-looked at, at like what local approval meant because in Holyoke, it was two times that it had been shot down because it had always been put through city council. And so they re-looked at what like local approval meant and they decided it meant local board of health. And what that did was it put it out of the hands of a political process and put it into the hands of public health officials. Yeah. So we opened and two months later, a lawsuit was filed by the Holyoke City Council <laughs> questioning our you know, the legality of us opening. Four years later, a ruling was found that actually in Holyoke that city council should have local approval. So at that time in 2016, we pulled out of the established pilot program and we refused to close and just said, we're gonna pay for these syringes on our own. And that's what we did. Until July of 2016, which was huge, you have no idea, or maybe you do, that um, it defines local approval as local boards of health and defining that as needing local, you know, board of health approval in each town instead of it being this ambiguous term. It really was a game changer. And I honestly, like, needle exchanges are opening up since then. Um, probably about, there's over 20 now. So in 2012 there were five and now there's 20. And they are starting to open up. I know, yeah. <laughs> they are starting to open up in the cities where the majority of HIV and hepatitis C is attributable to injection drug use. Because before then, pockets of Boston, pockets of Cambridge, you know, has had high concentrations of drug use, but it is arguable that, you know, until 2012, it was the most like liberal whatever towns that allowed for needle exchange and they weren't implemented in the places that they needed to be. Um, after that was passed, we were able to do a lot of hard work in Western Mass and the towns of Greenfield, North Adams and Pittsfield have all approved a needle exchange in the past year. Also, last summer, um, in result of a, another lawsuit that took place in Cape Cod, um, there was a syringe access site that was operating without local approval and word got out and um, you know there was legal action to try to close it and then that made its way to the, um, the Supreme Judicial Court and in June of 2017 they ruled that any form of syringe distribution is actually legal. So that doesn't mean just programs such as tapestries. That means that the many, many underground needle exchanges that have existed for many years before any authorized needle exchanges were open, 
those can finally now be legal and people are able to give other people syringes without the fear of being arrested or shut down if it's through another organization. Yeah, that's a clapping. It's good. Um, so now we're here, and I just wanted, I'm not sure if Dr. Wally really gave himself the credit he deserves because uh, he is the medical director that signed. I'm sorry, I hope I can explain this. <laughs> He's the one that made it possible for programs such as Tapestry for lay people to give out Narcan. Yeah. <laughs> I like all this clapping. This is good. So when you know we, we tapestry started be a part of this pilot program in 2008, and it started off in Springfield and Northampton. And when I also started soon after that, um, it was impossible to get into any halfway house. Police would not talk to us. Any type of le you know legal people would not talk to us. Narcan was just widely and commonly viewed that it did enable drug use and it can't be in the hands of drug users. That tie kind of I think shifted. There was a tipping point um, when the opioid epidemic was declared, and there has been an incredibly you know rising cost in the amount of fatal overdoses these past years. But to be honest, um, the epidemic, the opioid epidemic in Massachusetts was classified as that when the people that started dying were reflective of the people in power. So it started reflecting, you know, <laughs> people in um, rural white areas finally got the attention of local officials, and that's when things really started to ramp up. And, you know, it's, it's been a lot of success these past few years. Um, and I just wanted the last, these last few slides focus on overdose and our Narcan data as part of this Narcan pilot program. So this slide here just shows the number of people that have come back to tell us that they've used the Narcan that we gave them to, to reverse a potential overdose. We've enrolled thousands and thousands of people all over Western Mass. But I just wanted to show this because of the study increased. And I also, going back to when I started in um, 2008, I, uh, I started out at, in Springfield, and they have always been a program, an HIV health prevention program that works with active injection drug users, concentrates on the Latino population, primarily in the south end and north end of Springfield, goes out and does street outreach on a daily basis, provides HIV testing, hepatitis C testing, and gives out Narcan. However, up till now, they are not legally able to give out needles. So, Going back to the first slide, which I won't flip back to, that image of that guy picking up syringes, that was in Springfield. That photo was taken last summer. Um, they're allowed to go out to the train tracks, pick up syringes, and all that really the only option right now is to leave bleach kits. So we're not able, still not able to give it out in the city. And one thing that I find really interesting is that this is Holyoke. The blue is the amount of reported overdose deaths, and the pink is the amount of overdose reversals for people coming in and telling us about it. We opened up in 2012 in Holyoke and there has been a, a pretty significant rise in the number of people that have been using a, this. Um, and before we were able to have a needle exchange, our Springfield program would also did a lot in Holyoke. Uh, we would go there multiple times a week and do syringe cleanups. We would go to the local treatment centers. We would go to the drop-in centers you know, engage in drug users and whatever. Um, but it wasn't until the Holyoke Needle Exchange opened that the rise of people coming back to us and, and getting Narcan and reporting that they have used a Narcan really started to rise. And we, we target active injection drug users. And active injection drug users are up to 10 times more likely to witness an overdose compared to a first responder. So this life-saving work that you know, was made possible by people on this panel, such as these people, um, is, is the evidence has been there for so long, but the stigma continues. So this is Holyoke, and this is Springfield. Holyoke and Springfield has you know, similar demographics. Both of them are close to 50% Latino. And again, Springfield has the third highest rate of HIV. Holyoke has the fourth. Uh, even though overdoses have decreased this past year, they have doubled um, within the Latino population. 
Our Springfield and Holyoke program are basically modeled the exact same way and have the exact kind of demographics and you know in, in similar neighborhoods. The staff are all trained the same way and do the same things. Syringe access, no syringe access. So I think I'll stop there. But <laughs> in summary, in conclusion, we need a needle exchange in Springfield now. That's it. <laughs>